right. In terms of the ceremony, Father will help out at the beginning with distribution of the palms, and then he'll be back in the confessional after the procession except during communion. So we'll have confessions again after the procession. We'll start by blessing the palms up here. That table will get moved back a little bit. There's actually two ways to bless palms, either up here in the sanctuary like we'll do this morning, or the other way, which is a person can hold them in their hands. It pertains, this blessing actually pertains to palms and other branches because it has like olives or any other kind of branches. And so if the faithful bring other branches, uh, they can uh, bless them. So we bless the palms and whatever they're holding, including palms in their hands. And you go around and, and uh, sprinkle them with holy water and incense. So I think maybe because uh, it, we're far enough south here that you can get other branches, uh, this is an early Easter, but after that we could do it that way when it's later in the season. And that way you can have more uh, blessed objects around. As you probably know, I'm into sack metals, and the particular blessing on these, among other things, uh, helps keep away evil spirits. So it's a very, they're very powerful sack of metal. Anyway. This morning we'll bless all the palms up here and then we'll pass them out just like communion. We'll start up at the altar with the altar boys after we bless them and, and, and whatnot. And uh, then you just come up like communion, we'll give you the palms. Then, uh, then after everybody's got their palms, go over and wash my hands and we'll, we'll there, you sing the gospel, which is the gospel I just read for Palm Sunday. After that, then I'll sing Proche Damas and Pache. And then the, the Thurifer and the cross bearing the acolytes and myself go out. And then from the front pews going backwards, you'd fall in behind. And we'll go out the main door. We'll go this way. We'll just go up this side of the parking lot, make a curve, down the other side, the, the far side of the parking lot, and then back in. So that'll be the way it goes. We'll be in the front. Then if you go like that, then when you come back in, it makes it more orderly so there's not a car wreck. So the front pews to the back pews, and then when you come back in, it, it gets it. Anybody that has troubles or whatever, don't feel bad at all about, about staying, staying in here. Okay, so uh, you can put your palms down. Uh, once, we, once we're in, I say one more prayer, because there's one more blessing that has to do with keeping away the evil spirits. But once Mass starts, you can put your palms down. Uh, you no longer hold the palms during the Passion. Mass is the same from that point on, except that there's no last gospel. Okay, now what does all this mean? Well, we could preach on any one of these things for a long time, but we'll make a few quick remarks this morning. First about that first Palm Sunday in our Lord, and then about, in more particular about the ceremonies here this morning. Let's start with the route our Lord chose to go into Jerusalem. On Palm Sunday, our Lord comes up to Jerusalem from Bethany, now, Bethany means the house of ripe figs. Bethany, of course, is the home of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And it's also where during all of Holy Week, our Lord will come down from Jerusalem and return to spend the night. Every night, of course, until Holy Thursday. So our Lord comes up to Jerusalem from Bethany through Bethphage. He comes, he go, comes from the house of ripe figs and goes to Bethphage. Bethphage means the house of unripe green figs. So what? What does all this mean? Well, if we turn back the clock to about a year before Holy Week, earlier in his public ministry, our Lord had warned the multitudes, unless you repent, you will all perish. And immediately after that warning, immediately after he'd said that, our Lord then told them a parable. Quote, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Lo, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And the vine dresser answered him, Let it alone, sir, this year also, till I dig about it and put on manure. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Close quote. The multitudes to whom our Lord was speaking knew exactly what he was talking about. He's warning them to bring forth fruits of repentance. In the parable, the man who owns the vineyard stands for God the Father. The vine dresser stands for Christ our Lord. The fig tree stands for the Jewish nation, which, of course, our Lord spent three and a half years trying to get good fruits to come forth from his people. So what's the meaning of his path in Jerusalem? He's coming up from Bethany, the house of ripe figs, a town where he has found fruits of repentance 
For example, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Martha, St. Lazarus. He's coming from there and he's coming up through Bethphage, the house of unripe green figs, into the holy city. It's a symbolic warning. And then the day after Palm Sunday, as he comes again up to Jerusalem from Bethany to Bethphage, he stops at that fig tree and searches for fruit. When he finds none, he curses it and it withers and dies. That's a symbolic, a frightening ending to his parable. He sought fruit on that fig tree and he found none. Just as for three and a half years, he's been seeking good fruit from his people. It's obvious what he's saying when he does that. What about our Lord riding up on an ass and the colt of an ass? What's all that about? That's the fulfillment of a prophecy, prophecy of Zacharias. The fathers point out that our Lord first rode the ass, then got right off her, and then climbed on the colt and rode the colt into town. Why? The ass is broke to ride, and the colt wasn't. The ass is a symbol of the Jews, who had been subject to God and his law. Well, the colt represented the Gentiles who had been running wild. When our Lord rode the ass briefly and then got off and rode in on the colt, he was again symbolically warning the Jews they were about to be rejected, and the Gentiles were to take their place. So what's with the palms? In the olden days, for both the Jews and the Gentiles, palms symbolized victory and triumph. For example, in the Old Testament books of Leviticus and 1st Maccabees, we can see palms used by the Jews for just these purposes, as of course we see today in our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. At Roman games, the champions got palm branches, and palms were also used in the great triumphs which a Roman emperor would use to celebrate a victory. We still see this idea in Christian art and writing. We talk about martyrs receiving the palm of martyrdom. And you'll see a lot of times in holy cards or paintings in old churches or stained glass where there's a martyr standing there holding a palm in one hand. What does it stand for? The triumphal victory over death. Now there's a lot more symbolism here, but we'll just stop there and take a moment to briefly consider some of the symbolism of what we're doing here. The procession outside and then back into the church on the first level represents our, first, our Lord's entry into Jerusalem. But on another level, it also represents his triumphal entry into that heavenly Jerusalem. Now this was easier to see until Pope Pius XII changed the Holy Week ceremonies in 1955. Because until then, when the procession would arrive back at the church, the doors were closed. And on the inside, there'd be singers representing the holy angels, the church triumphant, and they'd be singing that beautiful hymn, Glory, Laus, and Honor, uh, 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 Sit Rex Christi Redemptor, which is glory, honor, and praise be to thee, O, o King Christ, our Redeemer. And that they're singing celebration of our Lord coming up to the heavenly Jerusalem. And then the outside, the choir outside would answer them as, as uh, representing uh, the church militant here on earth. After the whole, earth, whole hymn was sung back and forth through the closed doors, then the guy carrying the cross would slam on the, bang on the doors with the cross. The doors represent the gates of heaven that were slammed shut by Adam's sin and closed. And bang it on the cross, as soon as he hit it with the cross, they'd be thrown open, which symbolizes, represents the opening of heaven by the holy cross of our Lord. And then his ascension leading those members of the church militant who have triumphed, carrying their palms into that heavenly Jerusalem. Right after that then, during the course of the Mass, we turn to the singing of the Passion. So we've just had this triumph that represents, of course, Palm Sunday, the triumph into Jerusalem, and Ascension Thursday, the triumph into heaven. But then we turn to the singing of the Passion. Now there's another change. Until 1955, during the Passion, we would hold our palms during the singing of the Passion. And this symbolized that although his disciples abandoned him during his passion, we'd be faithful to him until the end. But for the past 50 years, liturgically speaking, we no longer declare two things. It's been changed. We're no longer clearly declaring, without the banging on the door of the cross, that only by means of the cross can we get to heaven. By not holding the palms up, we're no longer clearly declaring that we're going to remain faithful to Christ, even in the passion of his mystical body. 
I think those changes are prophetic. Now, the singing of the Passion reminds us that between the triumphal procession of our Lord into the earthly Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and his triumphal procession into the heavenly Jerusalem on Ascension Thursday, our Lord had to suffer his agony and his passion. And that ought to give each one of us pause. Because in the first place, we put him through it by our sins. And in the second place, because as Catholics, as members blessed to be members of the true religion, our Lord has the same message for us as he had for the Jews. He's been coming to look for fruits of repentance in our lives during this holy season of Lent. He's warned each of us time and again that unless you repent, you will surely perish. In the third place, just as our Lord used his path in Jerusalem, a fig tree and an ass and a colt, to warn the Jewish people of his collective judgment of them, so also he's given us, Catholics, very clear indications of his collective judgment of us. Let's consider two. First, at the eighth station of the cross, our Lord says to the weeping women, Don't weep for me, weep for your children. For there will come a time when they say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, the breasts that never gave suck. In other words, our Lord is telling the women they should weep for the people that live in that time. A time when our Lord will come again looking for fruit. Fruit of the womb. Babies. But instead of finding those fruits, he'll find people, his people, that say, blessed are the barren. He'll find people that actually think it's better to not have children, to be sterilized, to contracept, or even to abort those fruits. He's telling the women to weep for the people in that time who are not bringing forth the fruits he expects. And you don't need me to tell you we live in that time. Second, our Lord is also giving a very clear indication of his collective judgment of us by the state of his church. As St. John Hughes explains, quote, the most evident mark of God's anger and the most terrible castigation he can inflict upon the world are manifested when he permits his people to fall into the hands of clergy who are priests more in name than in deed. When God permits such things, it is a very positive proof that he is thoroughly angry with his people and is visiting his most dreadful anger upon them. Close quote. God's warning us, collectively, as a Catholic people, he's thoroughly angry with us. We need to bring forth fruits of repentance. We each need to become holy. And then we too can each win that glorious palm of victory and follow Christ in his triumphal procession into heaven. Let's each commit ourselves to holiness.